At the age of 45, Fauna Frey was temporarily living with her older brother and father in Dexter, Oregon. The three of them were running a family business that built and sold homes in Lane County. Sadly, on June 19, 2020, her older brother, Dallas Frey, died unexpectedly of a heart attack. This left Fauna heartbroken and the only surviving sibling after her sister died in 2006, just two years after her mother died. After Dallas's funeral, 45-year-old Fauna decided to go on a road trip and left home on June 27, 2020 at around 8 p.m. She had plans to make the two and a half hours drive from Dexter to Grants Pass, Oregon to give some of her brother's belongings to his friend. Since she didn't arrive at the friend's home until the next day, it's presumed that she slept in her car in an unknown location. The next day, on June 28, 2020, Fauna stopped at Cresswell 76, a gas station in Cresswell, Oregon, and made a few purchases. Then, at 11.45 a.m., she arrived at her brother's friend's home and stayed for about half an hour. Around 7.45 p.m., Fauna checked in at the Super 8 Hotel in Grants Pass, Oregon, and called her father from the phone in her room shortly after. The next day, on June 29, 2020, Fauna was once again seen in Grants Pass. However, this would be the last time she was ever seen again. According to her father, John Frey, Fauna sounded disoriented and distraught during their conversation. She talked about angels and mentioned that she had stopped near Wilderville earlier that day, which is about 10 miles west of Grants Pass, to give a female hitchhiker a ride. The day before she went missing, she bought two parking passes at the fish hatchery where she dropped the hitchhiker off. Investigators believe she might have bought the second pass with the intention of returning the following day. At 8.30 p.m. on June 28th, Fauna was captured on video surveillance at the Fred Meyer store in Grants Pass, where she purchased groceries, shampoo, a couple of beers, and clothing totaling $138. The next day, on June 29th, video surveillance from the Super 8 Motel would show her leaving between 8.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. with her bags. Then, around 11.44 a.m., Fauna made a $200 cash withdrawal from Umpqua Bank in Rogue River, Oregon, about 10 miles east of Grants Pass. At 12.36 p.m., Fauna was captured on video surveillance at the Big Five Sporting's Goods Store in Grants Pass, where she purchased some camping gear and more clothes. At 2.35 p.m., Fauna called the Wisku Inn, a small motel along the Rogue River in Grants Pass, and made a reservation for the night. At 3.39 p.m., she went to the Gooseberries Grocery Store in Grants Pass, where she purchased 10 packs of tuna, 3 cans of iced coffee, and a smoothie. Unfortunately, this was the last time her credit card was ever used, and Fauna never showed up at the Wisku Inn that night and has never been heard from again. On July 1, 2020, her father filed a missing persons report with the Josephine County Sheriff's Office after being unable to get in touch with her. On September 23, 2020, over three months after her disappearance, Fauna's Jeep Grand Cherokee was found abandoned in a rural area on Reuben Mountain, about six miles up from the Grave Creek boat ramp on a spur road in Josephine County. This area is about an hour northwest of Grants Pass and is known for criminals and the homeless and is a vast area of rough terrain. Investigators wonder if Shauna might have been trying to help someone in need but was murdered instead. Although an extensive search was performed in the area, no new clues came to light, and cadaver dogs were unable to find additional leads. Based on the investigation, it is believed Fauna's vehicle was parked at the location for at least a month, if not longer, before being found. Frustratingly, DNA evidence and fingerprints taken from the Jeep are still waiting to be processed. State police informed Fauna's father that the evidence collected inside the car is at the end of a long list because no evidence was found that suggests a crime occurred. Her father said Fauna was familiar with Southern Oregon because she lived there for many years before moving north. He also said she was accustomed to the outdoors and would hike regularly. Some speculate that the female hitchhiker she picked up stuck around in Grants Pass and she bought things for her, such as flashlights and clothes. 
One theory is that the female hitchhiker could have met up with her own friends there and more than one person did something to her. Fauna left her laptop and cell phone at home and typically used a burner phone to keep in contact with people, although some reports say that she had her late brother's cell phone with her, which could have been the burner phone, but that's unclear. A $25,000 reward is being offered for information leading to Fauna's discovery. The ordeal has been even more heart-wrenching for John Frey, since Fauna is his last surviving family member. Her father has been searching for someone capable of doing water sonar searches. Adventures with Purpose were contacted initially, but there's not much they can do since her Jeep was found. Fauna's father said that he fears his daughter may have been abducted since that area is known to be crime-ridden. In fact, there are over 50 active missing persons cases in Josephine County, Oregon alone, including 11 missing women since 2017 within a 40 to 50 mile radius of each other. A Facebook page was created titled Josephine County Missing Person Project to spread awareness of those who have gone missing in that county. However, as of June 2023, Fauna has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Kevin Winters grew up in Jenison, Michigan, in a very tight-knit family. He loved the outdoors, riding his dirt bike, and camping. Those who knew him described him as humble, kind, and gentle. Unfortunately, he suffered a bad dirt bike accident, resulting in his right leg being shorter than his left. In 2007, he left Michigan and moved 4,000 miles away to Hawaii with only a single bag of belongings. His family assumed he would never actually make it in Maui, one of the most expensive places to live, but he somehow made it work, and a year after his move, he began working the next 14 years at North Shore Hostel in downtown Wailuku. He was living and working there as a housekeeper in exchange for his room. However, on or around August 27th, Kevin lost his job at the hostel and was given seven days to move out. He was fired after being accused of stealing a coworker's cell phone, which his loved ones don't believe he would have ever done. On September 1st, 2021, Kevin was reportedly moving out, but his sister Karen Hopp said she was unsure where exactly her brother was moving to. He told her he had a storage unit down the street from the hostel, which contained a couch he would sometimes sleep on. He also owned a purple Jeep that he loved, but at the time, it wasn't running and had been sitting in the storage unit for over a year, so he got around the island on foot and by bus. On September 2nd, around 8.37 p.m., Kevin made a purchase at the Maui Brewing Company in Kahan, Hawaii, about an hour away from his storage unit. Then, at 9.45 p.m., Kevin was captured on security footage depositing a $40 check at an ATM at the First Hawaiian Bank near the brewery. When his sister found out about the deposit, she found it strange because he rarely made deposits. The next morning, on September 3rd, 2021, security footage captured Kevin making another deposit at the same ATM in the same clothing. This time, he deposited $190. That was the last time anyone ever saw Kevin. He disappeared along with his cell phone, which last pinged to a cell tower around 11 a.m. on the day he vanished. He spoke to his mother, Maxine, daily, and even spoke to her on the last day he was seen. She said the conversation was short and sweet and everything seemed normal. By September 8th, after days of no communication from Kevin, his parents raised the alarm and called other family members and the Maui police, but for some reason, the missing person report wasn't filed until September 19th. His co-workers at the hostel said he never even picked up his last paycheck. Karen said that since none of her family lives in Hawaii, it was initially difficult to look for him. She said their correspondence was with one friend of Kevin's and detectives, who, according to Karen, could have been more helpful. Instead, detectives kept saying that he could be on a bender, fell asleep, or died from COVID. On November 9th, 2021, Karen said she and her husband flew to Hawaii to look for Kevin themselves, going to the bars Kevin frequented. 
She added that the bartender's information indicated that Kevin did not have a drinking problem. Karen also put up missing person flyers around town. Family, friends, and former co-workers say that Kevin is kind-hearted and friendly and has no known enemies or a criminal record. Karen runs the Find Kevin Winners Facebook page to track any leads that might help find him. Kevin is known for wearing black shoes with a special lift in one of them to ease the pain in his hip, and he appeared to be wearing those shoes when he went missing. His siblings found a bank statement showing their brother had nearly $8,000 in his account in mid-2020, but at the time of his disappearance, it was down to $1,100. They've never been able to determine where the rest of the money went. Kevin never married, did not have children, and it is unclear if he was dating anyone at the time. His bank account hasn't been touched since the last day he was seen, and his loved one said he would have never voluntarily stopped his daily communications with his mother. His family has increased the reward to $2,000 for information leading to his location. However, as of June 2023, Kevin has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Monique Juanita Smith was born on December 12, 1986. In 2017, at the age of 30, Monique was the mother of three, living near New Orleans in the 4200 block of Toro Street in Gentilly, Louisiana. Monique was a hardworking, single mom employed as head cook at Ted's Fro Stop Diner in Uptown New Orleans and was estranged from her husband of nearly eight years. On March 29, 2017, Monique and her three children, 12-year-old Amaya, 10-year-old Justin Jr., and 6-year-old Jamiron, were looking forward to attending an award ceremony the following day at Samuel J. Green Charter School, where both Amaya and Justin were going to receive an award. Monique also wanted to spend the day looking for a new car. However, they would never make it to the ceremony because tragedy would strike the entire family in the early morning hours of March 30th. At around 4 a.m., someone entered the home and shot not only Monique, but her three children as well as they lay in bed sleeping. At approximately 4.18 a.m., Amaya, who was barely clinging to life after being shot in the face, called 911 and asked for help. Amaya was rushed to the hospital and would thankfully survive her injuries after going through emergency surgery, but unfortunately, Monique and her two sons were not so lucky. Investigators believe the suspect forced his way through the back door, shot Monique in the downstairs bedroom, then made his way upstairs where he shot the children before fleeing the scene. Her husband was an initial suspect, but he was three hours away in Jackson, Mississippi, working his early morning shift as a garbage collector. He clocked in about 5.30 a.m., which was about an hour and a half after police dispatchers first received reports of the shooting. He was checked for gunshot residue and, after a few days, was cleared as a suspect. However, according to her estranged husband, Monique was dating someone, but she never told him his name. The authorities believe the homicides resulted from an ordered hit, as nothing was taken from the home. With the help of the surviving daughter, the police were able to create a sketch of the suspect. Police believe he's familiar with Monique's house and her family. When Amaya woke up in the hospital, she began crying to her father, worried that the shooter was going to come back. Her father, Justin, said his daughter slowly recovered after she was shot in the face and throat, but has since had trouble sleeping. With no further leads, this case has sadly gone cold, and as of June 2023, it remains unsolved. Regina Marie Rowell was born on December 23, 1960, and graduated from Grace King High School in 1978. At the age of 20, Regina was living in Metairie, Louisiana, and working at the VA Medical Center on Tulane Avenue in New Orleans. On the morning of March 10, 1981, Regina, who was usually headed for work, would sadly never make it. 
Authorities discovered her car abandoned on the Huey P. Long Bridge, and since her car was still running with her purse inside, they believed she possibly jumped to her death. Sadly, she was never seen again. Regina was one of five siblings, and after the family was informed of what possibly happened, they were basically expected never to talk about it again. The siblings felt this was most likely due to the family feeling ashamed if she did indeed jump. However, this troubled her siblings for years, who initially bought into this story, but as they grew older, began to question it more. However, there were no witnesses, even though this was supposedly mid-morning on a Monday in the spring of 1981. There was never a police investigation, no record of a police report, no record of a complaint being called in about a car on the bridge, no analysis of her car, no news coverage or newspaper articles, and her body was never found. Years later, the court would eventually declare Regina legally dead. In May 2012, her family was shocked when someone called Crime Stoppers with a tip. The caller said that Regina had not taken her own life and instead was the victim of a crime. The information was sent to the Kenner Police Department Criminal Investigations Division, but since there was no police report to corroborate the tipster's information, the detectives told them there was nothing more they could do. This frustrated her family, knowing there was no investigation of her initial disappearance or the Crime Stoppers tip. The Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office has allegedly been unable to locate any records of her disappearance, and since her family believed she had taken her own life, they never reported her missing. Over 40 years later, her family continues to search for answers. They hope that someone, somewhere, can provide them with information on what really happened to Regina that day. In 2020, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office reopened her case, and DNA was collected from a few of Regina's immediate family members to compare against other unidentified women. However, as of June 2023, Regina has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. William Alfred Higgins was born on December 3, 1933, and went by the name Bill. Bill met his soon-to-be wife, Dolores, in 1954 when she was 17 and he was 21. They were then forced to get married in 1955 after she became pregnant, and by 1966, Bill and Dolores had six kids together. At the age of 35, Bill and Dolores were living a short distance from downtown in McKeesport, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, with their six children. At the time, the steel industry still had a huge presence in McKeesport, and it's how Bill made his living. In 1969, he was employed by the Christie Parks Works Plant, making bayonets, bullets, and other ammunitions for the Vietnam War. Aside from working at the plant, Bill would also do side work, cutting lawns, painting, and paneling, and he was known to be very good at working on cars. In addition, he enjoyed hunting, smoking L&M cigarettes, and drinking Iron City beer at the bar in his free time. By 1969, Bill and Dolores' marriage was falling apart, with Bill spending most of his time at local bars and both of them having allegedly stepped outside the marriage. In late May or early April of 1969, Bill vanished into thin air after leaving work to make the two-mile drive home in his 1955 Chevy pickup truck. Authorities deemed his disappearance suspicious and were trying to figure out what happened on the short drive home. Multiple rumors began circulating after his disappearance, including that he just simply didn't come home one day or that he came home, he and his wife argued, he threw some things in his truck and left. Those rumors also including him loading his truck on a barge and going to Alaska. It was also said that he was murdered and thrown into a whale. And last but not least, that he went to Florida to live on a boat with a girlfriend to avoid paying child support. However, Bill reportedly didn't know anyone in Florida, and his siblings said that he hated the beach, so this seems very unlikely. Unfortunately, a flood in 1980 destroyed the investigative records on his missing person case. At the time of Bill's disappearance, the older children were at school, and the two youngest at home were only toddlers. 
One of his older children stated that on the day he disappeared, Dolores was upset, saying Bill left and her parents were at the house. A report was filed at the police station a few days later. His truck was never located, but there is a body of water on his route home, but a search of the river decades later didn't turn up his missing truck. In fact, Adam Brown Adventures and his team searched the local rivers for his truck using sonar technology, but never found it. Interestingly, just a few weeks after his disappearance, a neighbor who was younger and well-known in the area for being a troublemaker moved in with Bill's wife and the kids. He allegedly wanted to be with Bill's wife, but didn't want to raise the children and treated them horribly. Dolores' brother, who owned the home, and his wife visited when they heard that Bill left and found the neighbor had already moved in. They were very upset, and so Dolores and the neighbor, along with the children, moved a few streets away. Bill's home then suspiciously burned down shortly after the move. Dolores and her brother never spoke again after the incident. In 1972, the neighbor and Dolores got married after her marriage to Bill was absolved on the grounds of abandonment. They had two children together, and he was forced into the military. However, after going to boot camp, he went AWOL, and his military records burned down in a building in 1973. Not only did Bill not pick up his last paycheck, but he was very close to his mother, and his family feels he would never have left without some contact with her. He took her to church every Sunday and would wait in his truck for her. It's thought that maybe Bill came home, found the neighbor with his wife, a fight broke out, and one or both of them murdered Bill. All ties were broken between Bill's children and Bill's family. They would not reunite until years later and began working together to try and discover what actually happened to Bill. His remaining family member submitted DNA several years ago for comparison to any unidentified remains that might be found, but so far nothing. Dolores, now in her 80s, continues to deny any knowledge or memory of what happened to Bill and refuses to talk about it. As of June 2023, Bill has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>